The idea of creating artificial beings, mimicking the appearance and actions of either humans or animals, is well established in science fiction, and increasingly becoming a part of science fact through modern robotics and artificial intelligence. But this futuristic concept also has a surprisingly long history. What we would call robots today are generally machines that are programmable by an electronic computer, and in that sense they could have only been made by the mid-20th century. But there were mechanical devices before them that could perform a set number of actions independently. These are what are known as automata, and just like modern robots, they are often made to look and act like humans or animals. The history of automata stretches back thousands of years, and they've been made in many cultures from Greece to India and China. In this video, we'll be focusing specifically on the ancient Mediterranean world and see the development of lifelike automata from a concept in mythology to the earliest simple devices and finally to the mechanical wonders of Greece and Rome. The word automaton comes from ancient Greek, and originally simply referred to any event that happens spontaneously, without external influence. It was therefore closely linked to the idea of the Golden Age, a mythical era when the titan Kronos ruled the earth, and nature spontaneously supplied humans with everything they needed or wished for. It was only in the Hellenistic Age, beginning in the 4th century BC, that the word became associated with machines. But, although not referred to as such at the time, what we might call automata do appear in some of the very earliest Greek texts. In the Iliad, thought to have been written down in the 8th century BC, and perhaps composed as early as the 13th, the god of fire and craftsmen, Hephaestus, is said to have created a number of golden maidens to assist him. Having trouble walking on his own, the god is described as being supported by them as he limps across his hall. Moreover, the maidens are said to have, quote, understanding in their hearts, and in them speech and strength, and they know cunning handiwork by gift of the immortal gods. To put it into modern terms, you could say that they were equipped with a sort of artificial intelligence. The Odyssey, written down around the same time as the Iliad, features more of Hephaestus' creations. While the main character, Odysseus, enters the palace of Alcinous, he notices near its golden door the watchdogs. They were also built by Hephaestus in gold and silver, immortal and ageless, in order to protect the building. Their purpose as protectors implies that the dogs could move, but the passage describing them is quite vague, so we can't know for certain. Of all the mythological automata, the most famous is probably the bronze giant known as Talos. Having been crafted by Hephaestus, this mechanical being was given to King Minos of Crete, who set it to work, guarding the island from invaders. Every day, Talos circled its shores three times, and if Crete was attacked, he would hurl large stones at the enemy ships, or pick them out of the water, holding them to his chest and heating up his metal frame until they burst into flames. The machine was nearly indestructible, but had a weak spot in its ankle where a pipe carrying the life-giving substance known as Icor was bound shut by a single bronze nail. In the Argonautica, written in the 3rd century BC, the sorceress Medea uses this weakness to defeat Talos. By hypnotizing the giant, she drove him mad and made him pull out the nail. Consequently, Icor flowed from the wound and Talos bled to death. In Greek legend, the gods weren't alone in making automata. The mythical craftsman and artisan Daedalus, who famously made artificial wings so that he and his son Icarus could escape imprisonment on the island of Crete, is also said to have created moving statues. They are mentioned in many sources, for example in Plato's Mino where Socrates claims that they would run away if they weren't fastened to the ground, and Aristotle relates that Daedalus' wooden statue of Aphrodite purportedly was animated by Mercury, which was thought at the time to be a living substance. So, the idea of statues that could move and act on their own was present in Greek myth from very early times, but in the first couple of centuries BC, Greek mechanics, and especially a group active in Alexandria, would begin to create real automata. But they weren't the first to attempt it. While the earliest Greek myths were still in the process of being composed, the ancient Egyptians were trying to animate their sacred statues. 
There are a number of stories and even some physical evidence for this. For example, it is said that in the 1100s BC, the powerful priests of Amun used an automaton to choose who became the next pharaoh. Shaped in the image of their god, the machine would have been constructed in Napata in what is now Sudan and had limited powers of movement and speech. To choose a new ruler, all the males of the royal family were made to pass in front of it, and the statue would then stretch out its arm to seize one of them, while at the same time delivering an exhortation to him. Statues with similar abilities have actually been discovered. Although they don't act on their own, they can be seen as proto-automata, and anticipate later developments. This rare mechanical statuette, for example, could perform simple movements. It's believed to represent Hathor, goddess of the sky and fertility, and is carbon dated to between 8 to 900 BC. Probably recounting a mythological story, the statuette could, through the pulling of a string, raise its arms, one of which is now missing, to reveal her body. Its purpose was to capture the movements of a sacred dance, and it may have been used either in festivals or to entertain the supreme god Ra in his temple. In the city of Thebes, a bust has also been discovered that could at least give the illusion of speech. Unfortunately, I haven't been able to find a picture of it, but Egyptologist Gregory Lukianov wrote a paper describing the bust shortly after its discovery in 1936. Depicting the god Ra Harmachis, it's large and made of white sandstone. At the back of the bust, an oval cavity has been hollowed out in the neck, and from here a narrow canal leads to a small opening just under the god's right ear. This cannot be seen when looked at from the front, and so if a priest were to stand hidden behind the bust and speak into the cavity, his voice would have become modified in the tube and resounded as if it was the statue itself that spoke. There is one case of an Egyptian statue that could actually emit sound on its own, but it's unclear whether or not the phenomenon was man-made. In the 1st century BC, reports started coming in that one of two giant statues of Pharaoh Amenhotep III, located outside of Thebes, had begun making a sharp sound every morning at dawn. Commonly known as the Colossi of Memnon, these statues were visited by many well-known Greek and Roman writers. The geographer Strabo claims that he had actually heard the sound, but could by no means identify its source. Another geographer called Pausanias also visited the site and claimed that the sound could be compared to a string of a harp or a lyre breaking. The phenomenon had supposedly begun after an earthquake in 27 BC that led to the collapse of the northern colossus from its waist up. Although quite rare, a sudden heating of a broken stone in a hot, dry climate can produce this kind of sound. Furthermore, when the statue was repaired in 196 AD, the sound suddenly stopped. Even so, some researchers believe it's more likely to have come from a device located somewhere inside the statue. This contrivance would have then been removed or accidentally damaged during the restoration. Regardless of whether or not this was actually the case, the technical know-how to create such a device definitely existed in Egypt by this time. In 332 BC, the land of the pharaohs was conquered by Alexander the Great, who founded the city of Alexandria on the Mediterranean coast. Following his death, one of his generals called Ptolemy took control over Egypt and made Alexandria its new capital. There, either Ptolemy or his son Ptolemy II created a research institution known as the Museon, the Institution of the Muses. In Greek mythology, the Muses, daughters of Zeus, were patrons of arts and sciences, and this institution would be the origin of the modern word museum. It included the famous Library of Alexandria and allowed scientists to study in full freedom sponsored by the king for the prestige of the court. Among the wide range of experts employed were a skilled group of physicists or mechanics who would create a large number of advanced automata. The first of them was a man called Tasibius, who may also have been the first head of the museum. He is known primarily for his invention of an early type of pipe organ called a hydralis, as well as a suction pump and a water clock, the Clepsydra, which for more than 1800 years would remain the most accurate clock ever constructed. Tisibius is also believed to have made automata. A spectacular example of this can be found in a description of a festival held by Ptolemy II around 280-270 BC. 
Known as the Ptolemaia, it was a recurring event meant to legitimize the rule of the Ptolemies through lavish displays of splendor and wealth. Its highlight was the Grand Procession, a parade many miles in length featuring hundreds of massive elaborate floats, thousands of costumed actors, a full military review, and a host of exotic animals including but not limited to lions, elephants, ostriches, a bear, and a giraffe. The procession was divided into sections in honor of different gods, and in the one dedicated to Dionysus, we hear of a moving statue of Nysa, likely a personification of the god's birthplace. The richly embellished figure was driven on a four-wheeled cart led by sixty men, and would stand up on its own, pour a libation of milk from a golden cup, and then sit back down again. As the cart moved across the city, this sequence repeated in a loop. It's believed that the mechanism relied on the wheels of the cart to move, transferring circular energy to linear movement through a recent invention, the rack and pinion gear. The fact that the machine appears in connection with the Dionysus is probably no coincidence. Being a god of wine and intoxication, there is something particularly Dionysian about spontaneous movement and spontaneity in general. Dionysian rituals were also intent on disturbing binaries, human and animal, male and female, and in this case, animate and inanimate. As a result, Dionysus is frequently involved with automata. Tisibius is known to have written treatises describing his inventions, and one of them likely dealt with automata. Unfortunately though, they've all been lost, and although the statue of Nysa is often attributed to him, it's impossible to say for certain who made it. A younger colleague of Tisibius called Philo of Byzantium largely suffered the same fate, but one of his treatises, which happens to describe automata, survives. Entitled Pneumatics, it comes down to us from an Arabic translation and features a number of devices. One of them takes the form of a life-sized maid which in her right hand holds a jug. When you place the cup in the palm of her left hand, she automatically poured first wine and then water into it until a desired ratio of 1 to 2 was reached. This was accomplished through air pressure. Activated by the weight of the cup, the mechanism inside would allow air to flow into the first and then the second of two airtight vessels containing the wine and water. The pressure this introduced would push the liquids out through a set of tubes, terminating at the tip of the jug. Philo also described how to make statues move, a feature which has been integrated into this reconstruction of the maid. Motion is achieved by means of a counterweight that descends slowly inside the statue. The rope that holds it winds around a pivot that is thus forced to turn and give motion to two hidden wheels. Building on the advances of both Tisibius and Philo, Hero of Alexandria is one of the most famous engineers of antiquity. Best known for creating an early steam turbine called the Aeolipile, he lived in the 1st century AD and his treatises have largely survived intact. One of them, also called pneumatics, includes descriptions of 70 automata, driven either by air, steam, or water pressure. One of the more simple ones shows a scene that would have been common in front of a temple. Two worshippers are intent on a sacrifice, and when it is done they pour water on the altar to extinguish the fire. In this case, the altar is hollow and the heat from the fire causes air inside to expand. In turn, the air pushes water, which is contained inside the pedestal below, out through pipes terminating at the cups held by the figurines. Rather than pushing water out, some devices were able to drink. In this example, a small statue of the god Pan draws water from a fountain, and it can be turned around to water an animal. Its mouth is connected by a pipe to a tank that is normally filled with water. But whenever Pan faces the animal, it begins to be emptied, and air rushes into the pipe to fill the empty space. Thus, the figurine starts to drink from the cup presented to it. A similar trick was used to make mechanical birds chirp. In this device, water is poured into a hollow pedestal, forcing air out through a small tube. If the exit of this tube is bent to the surface of a body of water, it will produce a sound resembling that of a black cap. Hero writes that depending on how wide or long the pipe is, and on whether it's dipped into water or not, different notes resembling a wide range of birds can be made. Additionally, by having the water first flow into a container which when filled tips upside down, birds could be made to chirp at intervals. 
These techniques were integrated into more advanced devices as well, like this one, featuring a number of birds sitting next to a spring. On an axle nearby there is an owl which will occasionally turn towards the birds, upon which they will stop chirping and become silent. Then, when it turns away, they will start once again. Another device, recounting the eleventh labor of Hercules, produces a different kind of sound. As the story goes, Hercules was sent to collect three golden apples from the Garden of the Hesperides. But the fruits were protected by a dragon called Ladon, which he would have to slay. When the user picks up a golden apple lying on the ground, the device is activated and makes Hercules shoot an arrow at Ladon. Then a hidden compartment is filled with water, pushing air out through a tube. In this case, however, instead of chirping, it makes a hissing sound as the dragon is killed. Hero also wrote a treatise simply called Automata, and in it he describes mechanical theatres, mostly run by pulleys, weights, and rope. One of them features a procession taking place around a small temple to Dionysus. But not only can the figures around as well as the god inside the temple move, the entire mechanism can roll out to a pre-programmed position. When it arrives, a fire spontaneously starts on an altar in front of Dionysus, while water springs out from his holy staff and wine from his cup. Then the figures start dancing around the temple to the sound of drums and cymbals. After a while, the music stops and Dionysus turns to an altar on the other side, following which a fire starts here too and the spectacle begins all over again. When everything has been acted out, the theatre rolls back to its initial position. In the same treatise, Hero also gives a rare view into ancient attitudes towards automata. Justifying his work, he begins the text by writing, quote, The study of automaton making has been considered by our predecessors worthy of acceptance both because of the ingenuity of the craftsmanship involved and because of the stunning nature of the public spectacle. Unlike modern robots, then, ancient automata weren't thought of as machines that would replace human labor. Instead, they were used for entertainment as curiosities or in religious festivals and temples. Since worship in the ancient world was multi-directional, they were perfectly suited for this purpose. For example, a religious procession would involve both a call for the attention of the divine, but also some form of response, which could be embodied in the self-moving machine. As Hero frequently writes, the automaton was to instill in the viewer a sense of wonder. Although much of what we know about ancient automata comes down to us from the great mechanics of Alexandria, similar devices are attested elsewhere and some before the founding of the museum. Almost a century earlier, a Greek philosopher called Archytas is supposed to have created an artificial flying dove. Made out of wood, it was suspended to cables and driven by compressed air hidden inside. We only know of the device from much later sources, however, and exactly how it would have worked is unclear. Another pre-Alexandrian automaton is mentioned in connection to a Dionysian festival that took place in Athens in 308 BC. Probably a kind of carnival float, this mechanism was of all things shaped like a giant snail that moved on its own accord and left a trail of slime behind it. The reason for this seemingly odd design choice could be that the festival was held in March and that snails were seen as a symbol of spring. Additionally, a giant shell would have been an excellent place to hide the mechanism driving it. But here again, we don't get any details on how it worked, and it may well have been operated by humans treading on a sort of hamster wheel inside. The Greek island of Rhodes is also noted for its automata, and its strong tradition of mechanical engineering in general. Philo of Byzantium studied here, and the poet Pindar describes the island city as having animated figures adorning every public street. Eventually, both Greece and Egypt would be conquered by the Romans, who left no treatises on automata making of their own. Nonetheless, such machines are mentioned frequently in other literary sources and therefore seem to have been quite common. For example, one appears in a history book written in the 2nd century AD. The book claims that a self-moving wax statue of Julius Caesar was made for his funeral. It depicted the man rising from his deathbed and turning slowly to display his 23 bleeding wounds to the crowd. This successfully instigated the people of Rome against Caesar's killers, forcing them to flee the city. 
Another history from around the same time claims that Emperor Claudius would get so frustrated when his automata malfunctioned that he would send their manufacturers to fight in the arena as punishment. Even as late as the 5th century AD, grammarian and philosopher Macrobius refers to processions with self-moving or talking statues taking place in at least two Roman cities. At the same time as this observation was being made, classical antiquity was coming to an end. Although there is no consensus on exactly where to draw the line, the transition into the Dark Ages is often associated with the fall of the Western Roman Empire in the 5th century and with the early Muslim conquests 200 years later. The end of antiquity did not mean the end of automata, however. Although, as we have seen, many treatises on the subject have been lost, those of Hero and Philo continued to be copied and studied in the Eastern Roman Empire, and their knowledge would be transferred into the Islamic world and later back to Western Europe during the Renaissance. In this way, the advancements made in antiquity could be built on and would inspire new, ingenious machines. <laughs>